Uh, today we want to talk about the principles that are important in the manufacture of water leaf and parchment paper. We want to stress the fact that if we start out with the right raw materials, use the right process control, we're going to end up with the right product. We start out with pulp, we give it, add very little in the way of chemicals, we give it some refining, formation, and we come up with a water leaf. We start out with a water leaf, treat it with acid, add a tub size, and we come up with a finished uh, parchment. If we control these things properly, then we're going to come out with the right product all the time. The talk that I'm giving is based on theory and, and experience that I've developed over a number of years. It has technical background, but it also can be very practical. Now, one thing I want to stress, and I'll be coming back to all the time, is the fact that making water leaf and parchment is a continual compromise. There are very few steps in the process where you can say we want to do all we can in this direction, do all the refining we can because that will give us an excellent product, add all we can of a certain chemical because that will give us an excellent product. We have to use all these within limits and sometimes you want a pro uh, property in the sheet that requires a compromise between two or three different product, uh, properties. In other words, you can't have the maximum of one chemical because it'll interfere with something that you're adding later on. So we have to learn how to make these compromises in order to get the right product. In making water leaf, we start out with pulp. Pulp is made up of cellulose fibers. These are small fibers that you see when you tear a sheet of paper. They're hollow and made up of little fibrils wrapped around it, like something like a straw. They do not form very well unless that they're softened and refined so that they will make a good sheet of paper. We use different types of pulp. Basically, we use northern pulp from, from northern woods and southern wood. The southern woods are bigger and coarser. They tend to have perhaps a little more strength, but they do not form as well. The, the northern woods have, give a finer fiber that gives, in general, a better formation and, in a lot of ways, a better sheet of paper. So. In addition, we use some broke, and also they have in times used secondary fiber. I don't like to see secondary fiber used in, because it doesn't receive the acid as well as a, part, as a virgin fiber. It's much better to use virgin fiber. We use both bleached and unbleached pulp. The, both of them seem to parchmentize equally well. There doesn't seem to be any interfering in the parchmentizing effects by the color that's on the unbleached pulp. The cellulose fibers are made up of what we call alpha, beta, and gamma cellulose. The alpha cellulose is the largest cell, cell, uh, cellul cellulose molecule. The beta is a little smaller and the gamma is smallest. When they are dipped in the acid in the parchmentizing process, the cellulose starts to dissolve. And the gamma cellulose being the smallest fiber will dissolve very rapidly. And it'll dissolve to an extent that it's generally lost in the acid and not recovered because when you go through the parchmentizing process, you dip the water leaf into the acid, and the acid starts to dissolve the cellulose. And if it's left in there long enough, it will completely dissolve and become a, just a gel. 
what you have to do is dip it into the acid, leave it there long enough to dissolve part of the cellulose, then dip it into water so you stop this action before you destroy the fibers and structure of the sheet. So what happens they, in parchmentizing is that the beta cellulose tends to dissolve but still be in a heavy enough gel that can be precipitated onto the fibers and gives us the surface that we want from parchmentizing. The alpha cellulose is a much larger fiber uh, molecule and does not dissolve as completely and helps to maintain our structure. So that this is the basic theory that has been developed on parchmentizing and at the present time, in order to try to improve the water leaf, we are studying the various pulps that are available so that we can get an optimum amount of beta and alpha cellulose in the pulp so that we get the desired parchmentized properties. In making a sheet of water leaf, we have to make our choice as to the type of hardwood, our mount and type of hardwood and softwood pulp that we use. Generally for parchment it would be ideal if we could use all northern hardwood and northern softwood pulp. They form better and give a better sheet of parchment. However, southern pulps are generally cheaper and on certain grades we can use uh, percentages of southern pulps without harming the properties of the sheet and therefore we are doing that. In making a sheet of paper, the first process is to break it up into pulp, pulper and then run it through refiners. The refining is necessary to make the fibers pliable so they can be formed into a desirable sheet of paper. But we run into a problem if we refine too much, then we cannot parchmentize the sheet. I think maybe here's a good point place to mention this and show this chart. I'll come back to it later two or three times. But this shows the effect of freeness which is along the bottom portion of the curve. Freeness from, 10, from, a thou, uh, from 100 to 400 and the wet burst that can be developed into parchment. If you refine the sheet too much, it does, just does not receive the acid and you cannot parchmentize it and develop the wet strength. Uh, also, you get the same type of arrangement in that you can't parchmentize it and develop grease proofness. If you get a good parchmentized surface, you get grease proofness and resistance to red turpentine. If you refine it too much, you cannot get uh, grease proofness. Here you'll notice that if we start out with an unrefined pulp, we're going to be out with a freeness somewhere is over 400. And as you begin to refine it and come down the line, if you get down to a freeness below 200, you're going to have a wet burst of under 8. Now this data was developed on 25 pound natural uh, whale hide that we make for shingle paper. We have an eight minimum wet, wet burst on that grade. And what this chart shows is that if you're going to always have above a eight wet burst that you have to run with a freeness that's someplace up in here. And they just recently changed the freeness standard. I think it's 275 minimum now. So that that gets them just above this line so that they can safely meet that. Now another problem that goes into this, and this is why I was mentioning before that we have to watch the compromise. On this shingle paper, we do not want too many pinholes in it. If you put uh, a number on here for a number of pinholes per square inch, it would lay on that chart something like that. So that 
the number of pinholes per square inch is, is as you refine the paper goes down and we run into a problem on 55 parchment machine and that we get too many pinholes we do not get good uh, bonding en energy or sub uh, on the back side of the sheet there's too much release from the silicon cone penetrating through the sheet so that you can see to get wet burst why we should do very little refining but we also need to watch the pinholes and so that's where our compromise comes in here you cannot say we don't want to do refining because we want maximum wet burst you have to say yes we want refining because we all the refining we can stand because we need to reduce the number of pinholes because we do not want silicone penetrating to the back side of the sheet. Okay. The, we, we get this refining by use of Jordans. We get uh, both some fracturing or fibrillating of the fibers and also some cutting to make them shorter so that they will form better. When we get to the paper machine, we take these fibers and try to form them in such a way that we get to, uh, the proper formation and type of sheet that we want. And on the paper machine, they have certain factors that they try to control. This includes the head or the amount of pressure on the water as it leaves the head box and goes to the slice, the amount of shake on the wire, the number of foils and the location of the foils, the amount of vacuum. On some grades we want a perfect for, near perf, as near a perfect formation as we can get on our translucent papers. And when we do this we try to run with a head that's equal to the speed of the, of the wire. We use as much shake so as to get as much formation as we can we perhaps don't use as many foils or as much vacuum so that we can let the water carry down and get better formation and try to do th all those things to improve the formation of the sheet. When we make a model parchment, then we want the model in there. In order to get that, we have to raise the head so that the water flows out onto the wire faster than the wire is going and makes a clump formation we have to set the fibers on the wire quickly so that they don't have chance for, for this model to flow out. So in making the sheet of water leaf for parchment, you have to compromise on those types of factors. Also, in making a sheet of water leaf, it is very important that we control the drying. The drying is one of the factors where we really don't have much of a compromise to make because the ideal condition for water leaf is to be as dry as we can get it. If it's wet, you cannot parchmentize well. We'll come to that in a minute. Uh, we do some calendaring on the uh, paper machine. We don't seem to think it makes an awful lot of difference in the properties that we get on the parchment. One thing that they have noted recently is that and told me that they think that there's less fuzz on the tubes in the sour water when we counter the sheet lightly. We cannot counter the sheet hard or crush it because if you do it will not parchmentize. It just won't receive the acid. After we get the water leaf made we run tests on it and I wanted to show you this chart because certain of the of the properties that you make into water leaf are specified in the base materials that you put into it or the type of refining that's specified. In other words, if you start out with a certain type of pulp and give it a certain type of refining, and we do specify ref the refining, then you can only, you're going to develop a certain burst. The guys on the paper machine have only limited control of the burst because we specified that they can only use a certain pulp and they can only give it a certain amount of refining. So that's, they're limited there. Uh, 
the porosity ends up in the same classification. If you specify the refining and the uh, pulp, they are going to get a certain porosity. We get down into the next group of tests, which is clem freeness and absorbency. I consider freeness to be very critical, and I mentioned that it's a measure of the amount of water that will drain from the sheet, and it's controlled by the amount of refining that you give the pulp. If you give the pulp too much refining, it will not parchmentize well. The more refining you get, the lower your freeness number goes, and that's a critical property in measuring how the sheet's going to parchmentize. Absorbency is important because if you somehow get sizing or something else in the sheet that limits the absorbency, it won't also won't receive the acid and it won't parchmentize. Formus, formation, brightness, and opacity are important because they're usually uh, critical to the type of sheet that the customer wants. Oil and dirt are important because if you get oil on the sheet it will not parchmentize or if you have dirt it makes an undesirable sheet. Before I go into parchment, if there are any questions on water leaf, uh, I went over water leaf a little fast because we wanted to get more time into parchment today. Are there any questions on water leaf before we head into parchment? In making parchment, we dip the sheet into sulfuric acid at about 70, 65 to 70% or your 54 degree Baume. And there are certain factors that are real critical. There's the concentration or Baume, the temperature, the time in the acid, the type of pressing, and I have some charts that I developed a number of years ago, and these go back to a report that I made for the KV Kalamazoo Vegetable Parchment Company lab in 1948. So this stuff is not new. And the, what I wanted to m mention today is the effect of, on parchment strength of the acid. We have across the bottom of this chart the acid strength in, in balm A, and up on the side we have the wet burst you're going to develop. This was about a 30 pound parchment, and it was, is designed to show the effect of sulfuric acid. Now, this is another case where we run into this compromise that I wanted to stress today. Uh, what we have to do is to pick an area in this curve where the, the chart properties that we're interested in are as near level as they can because in any process you run, you're going to have variation. The guys can't control everything exactly. So that you want to have an area in the curve where you can work. You don't want to work in the area around 52 or 53 degree Baume because if they make a slight error, they can be down on the steep part of the curve instead of getting the desired wet burst, you're going to be falling off and getting a low value. And that's why that we run up with approximately a 54 degree Baume acid. Now, you might say we could go way on out. Actually, the sheet doesn't parchmentize as well if you get over 55 degree Baume, at least in practical way. And another problem you have is that if you try to run that high in Baume, you have to evaporate so much water out. We recover about a little over 80% of our acid. And for each pound of acid that we recover, we have to evaporate two pounds of water. And to evaporate two pounds of water requires a lot of steam and energy. So you don't want to evaporate to a higher Baume than necessary. So the ideal thing would to be operate as far back on this curve, then you don't have to evaporate as much, but stay far enough up on the curve so that you aren't on the 
area where you're going to have variations that are going to give variations in the product. This shows the effect of moisture content in the water leaf on a wet burst of parchment. And across the bottom we have the moisture in the water leaf with 4, 8, 12, 16 percent. And then the wet burst that you can develop along the side. The important thing to notice is that from zero moisture to four, the curve is pretty flat. And that is why we run with a 3% maximum on moisture content, because if you get a higher moisture content, then your wet burst, or in which is a measure of the overall parchmentizing, starts to drop off. You have to stay up in that area. Have another curve here show the effect of, of uh, acid temperature. And here again, we have this curve that is flat in this area between roughly 60 and 80 degrees Fahrenheit. If you get down below 50 per degree, uh, degrees Fahrenheit, your parchmentizing drops off very rapidly, and you want to get good parchmentizing. And we ordinarily try to run somewhere around 70 degrees Fahrenheit, which is in the middle part of the curve. If you go very far beyond 70 degrees Fahrenheit, you tend to get a rapid parchmentizing and a surface parchmentizing that is hard to dry and make a sheet that isn't cockled. It doesn't work as well. So you find here again we've made the compromise. We work, try to work in the middle of the area where we aren't affected by variations in acid temperature because there are any process you're going to have certain variations and you try to work in an area where that they won't cause a variation in your product. Uh, in parchmentizing like I have mentioned here, we try to dissolve the a small amount of the cellulose and then re-precipitate it on the fibers. And we tried to determine if we could have some effect on the finished sheet of parchment by varying the acid, the pressing. If you do a lot of pressing when the sheet has the dissolved cellulose, you might be able to perhaps move the cellulose, dissolve cellulose or amyloid as they call it, or you might be able to press the fibers closer together and give a, a better form parchment. We've tried heavy presses and air-loaded presses and never been able to show anything. One of the things we tried to do was close up pinholes that way. But also since the fact that you're dissolving the cellulose, and cellulose does dissolve in acid, if you could dissolve some of the cellulose into acid and then skip an acid vat, and you can, for purposes of, uh, of illustration, say this is the acid vat, go straight across this vat, of first vat of sour water here, and then pour some sulfuric acid on with cellulose dissolved in it up at this next acid press. See whether you could close some of the pinholes with that dissolved cellulose that's in the acid. We've tried that, and we haven't been able to do it. Show, we weren't able to show anything as a control why we took some fresh sulfuric acid, the same concentration, and poured it on at the same press right beside it. What we found out is where we poured the sulfuric acid with no cellulose in it gave the same type of sheet that we got with the parchment or the, where they poured the sulfuric acid with cellulose dissolved in it. So that experiment didn't work. We thought since we couldn't improve the uh, closing of pinholes or forming of the surface of parchment by using heavy pressure that perhaps on this press we could put a heavy scraper and we could just scrape that cellulose back right in that area or over here after it had more time to soften up. And we took a metal scraper with a sharp edge and tried to scrape it. And when we got down to the dry end, we 
couldn't see the difference where we'd scraped it and where we hadn't. So we haven't been able to indicate that we could change the parchment by pressing or scraping or anything like that. It just doesn't seem to work. Uh, and were there any questions on sulfuric acid, uh, the acid portion of parchmentizing before we go on? And the, after we leave the sulfuric acid, and the parchment has been in the sulfuric acid about two seconds, we go into sour water. And the main purpose, and essentially, as far as most sheet properties, uh, the main purpose of sour water is to reclaim the sulfuric acid so it can be reused. And at this time right now, we are reclaiming about 80%. We have had our sour water section in condition where it could reclaim over 90%. Uh, Patterson told me when they had their plant in operation that they were reclaiming over 95% of their sulfuric acid. Right now, the sour water presses uh, aren't in, is maintained and all in operation. So that, but that's the main purpose of the sour water. Now, with regard to, to this, I wanted to make a point in that recovering the sulfuric acid, we have a number of vats and they were originally set up so each vat had a press following the vat. You dip in the vat, come up, go through the press, and then down into the next vat. And when you do this, you can go along and measure the bom A in each, or acid concentration in each vat. And as you do this, say the acid vat is over in this area, the, this will be the strongest, and this one will be a little less, and this one will be a little less until you get down near the wash water and the acid concentration sometimes is so low that you can't hardly measure it in bom A down below one. But what happens when you don't have an acid, pr uh, a press section here? If you don't have a press section, and say, after this vat, then an awful lot of the sour water is carried forward so that you're moving a lot of gallons of water in this direction. And essentially what happens is both of these vats are the same concentration. And if you don't have this press, then this vat is also the same concentration. And in removing the acid from the parchment, which is also a function of the, of, is a function of the sour water, you, your rate at which you do this is a matter of the driving force. In other words, the differential, the concentration of the sour water and the acid in the parchment. The sour water has a bone may of about 35, and the acid in the parchment as it leaves the acid vat is the 54 degree bohm A. So you have that much driving force. So every time that a sour water press is left up, we lose efficiency. Uh, as a rule of thumb, we, when number 14 parchment machine used to be in good shape, it had nine functioning presses. At that time, we could, on uh, 27 parchment, we could run it with approximately uh, five to nine pounds of sulfuric acid lost into the washer section from that uh, unit. On 55 parchment machine had 17 presses, and if most all those were not good operation, we'd be down from one to two or three pounds of, of uh, sulfuric acid lost per 100 pounds of parchment. So that it is, important. It's important not only to, because you have to <coughs> recover your sulfuric acid, but also any acid that goes through into the wash section has to be neutralized. And that takes extra alkali to do. Uh, temperature in the sour water is not real critical. Uh, you do tend to increase the surface parchmentizing and they claim you get more cockle if the temperature is too high. Uh, I don't know if I've seen anything 
in specific in acid temperature or solid water temperature that would affect the basic properties of the finished sheet. In washing, I put a note item up here under first item under washing. The most critical factor in your washing is the final sour water press because if you don't have a good sour water press and hold back as much acid as you can, every pound of acid that comes through that sour water press has to be neutralized. The same thing applies for the acid press. The acid press is very critical. Every pound of acid that goes through that acid press has to be take, taken out in the sour water and recovered or has to be neutralized. So in the parchment machine there are three very critical presses. The one at the acid vat, the one at the end of the sour water section, and the one before the dryers. Uh, in the washing of parchment, we use an alkali to help speed up the neutralization. Years ago, we used ammonia. And ammonia was a real efficient and easy to use alkali to neutralize the sulfuric acid. When you mix a, any acid and alkali, you get a salt, and we're going to be talking about salts and the effect on the parchment and the treatments that we use on the parchment a little bit later, so that we want to also talk, well, we use ammonia as a prime, we used to use ammonia as a primary neutralizing agent. We went to caustic soda and we went now to soda ash. We cannot use ammonia for two reasons. One reason is it contains nitrogen and uh, our wash water is, goes out to our waste treatment plant and through the waste treatment plant to the river. The nitrogen would carry through to the river and it is a plant food and it would increase the algae growth and the weeds in the, in the river. So we had to go away from ammonia. Also ammonia forms an acid salt. Some salts tend to be acid, some salts tend to be a little bit alkaline, and some salts are essentially neutral. Sodium chloride table salt is made from hydrochloric acid and sodium hydroxide, and it is neutral. And ammonium with sulfuric acid forms ammonium sulfate, which is acid. It results in, some of this is carried in onto the dryers and into the fi finished sheet it lowers the pH enough that if we try to run an oven browning on a sheet that's neutralized with ammonia, we're going to have a bad oven browning just because of the ammonium sulfate that is carried on with a sheet. So on our bakery tray lay liner pan, or bakery pan liner, we cannot use ammonia. Soda ash uh, also ends up giving you mixed with sulfuric acid gives you sodium sulfate which is essentially a neutral salt which gives you a neutral pH in the sheet which gives us a good oven browning. Now there's one problem that you have with soda ash that you don't have with ammonia. Put on extra ammonia and go drive it over the dryers and it's all driven off and goes to the atmosphere. So you can't get too high a pH. You can use three times as much ammonia as you need and you'll still come out with the desired pH because all the excess goes into the air. But if you use soda ash, it's not volatile. And if you use just a little excess, you're going to have too high a pH. Too high a pH is going to give you an oven browning problem. It's going to darken the sheet. It's going to give you, if it goes into your quillon bath, it's going to ruin your quillon bath. If it goes into silicone, it's going to ruin, ruin your silicone bath. So now that we're using soda ash, we have to be much more critical in how much alkali we use. Years ago, we could throw in all the ammonia, and the only problem we had is it cost too much. You throw in extra soda ash, it's going to cost a little extra, but you're going to ruin the paper. In washing, we have the same problem that we were mentioning on the sour water. 
if you have these presses up, you carry an awful lot of water forward and you get, instead of having the effect of three vats here, if you had the presses up, you have the effect of essentially one. You, you lose a lot of your washing efficiency. So it's critical that we have these presses maintained and working properly. Because if you don't, you carry the, the acid forward. After you've added the alkali and it's essentially neutral, you carry the salts forward. It's critical that in washing, that the last two or say the dryers are on this end, that the last, say, three vats be essentially clear water. So you're washing as many of these salts off the surface of the sheet as you can because you don't want to carry them forward onto the dryers or into the tub size or in the finished sheet. You want to hold, wash them off and keep them back. So it's critical that all these presses be working and that you hold, hold back as much of the water and alkali as you can. When we are washing, it's, we like to use as warm a water as we can because uh, temperature increases the rate of diffusion of the acid out from the sheet and gives you a faster, more efficient washing. So that's why they like to use hot water in the washers, it's probably as hot as you can hold your hands in conveniently, a little hundred or a little over. Uh, we have to have some showers or sprays in the washer section because if you have these washer vats and in this picture you're looking down the, the tubes uh, if you don't have a shower in there or a spray or something the water that's over that tube becomes a dead area there's no flow and as the sheet runs through there you build up acid over the tube and you will get better washing on the edges than you do on the sides because the acid is building up in the center of the sheet over the tube. Therefore, you have to have a shower or a spray or something to move the water over the tube and, and get this sheet uh, neutral or the same uh, washing all the way across. Otherwise, you're going to have sour, a sour center in the sheet. The last thing was that thing that you have to make sure that the last washer vats have fresh water so that you're carrying clear water on is, is the water you carry through from the washer section is as is, is clear and as neutral as can be. In drying, here again I say the final washer press is a critical item because every pound of water you carry out of that washer section, you have to dry on the dryer. If you carry a lot of surface water, not only do you have to dry it, but you carry the surface water, it'll tend to coat on to the dryer. And we have very hard water. You're going to get hard water scale on those dryers and they're going to get all uh, scaled up. And they won't be as efficient. And you won't get as, as is good drying. So that last washer vat is very critical, washer press is very critical to the drying. The next item I had listed there was dryer temperature. The theory in drying is that you should have graduated drying so you get a, a slow uniform drying to be free from cockle and get a good sheet. In my view of drying, I don't say that the dryer shouldn't be graduated and start with slow drying. It is critical that you get good dryer contact. In other words, it's critical that the sheet be in contact with that dryer uniformly as it carries forward in over the dryers. If it's not uniformly in contact, in contact with a dryer, you get a non-uniform heat transfer. This will give you areas where that the you'll get faster drying, 
and then different shrinkage rates, and this is what causes cockle, non-uniform appearance. Now you can get this non-uniform contact in two ways. One, you can heat the sheet real fast and generate steam between the dryer and the sheet of parchment. And this steam then will be like a bubble and insulate the sheet of parchment from the dryer. That way you will not get good dryer contact. Also, you can have scale on your dryers and you won't get good dryer contact and, or good uniform heat transfer. In maintaining this uniformity of drying, you need good felts and you need to keep the dryers clean. Uh, these properties are much more important if you're trying to run the printing papers on 65 parchment machine than they are when you're trying to make a pan liner on 23. And I'm sure you see the difference in the effort that's made to maintain the dryers in this area. Do we have any questions on parchmentizing as involves the acid section, the sour water section, or the washer section? The, the reason why it's, it's so translucent is so much more difficult to control and curl is the fact that you run it to a, a very high freeness. You do very little refining. Therefore, when you parchmentize, you get much higher degree of parchmentizing. More cellulose dissolves. The sheet becomes more transparent. It's more transparent than the other sheets. You want that. That's why you call it translucent. Uh, these are all properties you want. The other thing that happens, and this happens in every sheet, but on a translucent sheet, it's more apparent. On any time you parchmentize a sheet, the wire side tends to parchmentize more and to shrink more. And the felt side, as it's formed on the uh, paper, on paper machine, has some fines and some more of the ref refined fibers on top of it. It doesn't tend to parchmentize quite so much. So when you get it on the parchment machine, it's going to tend to curl more towards the wire side than a sheet that is, has a lower freeness. So yes, there is a difference and it's uh, important. I think there are things you can do to help yourself on that, but it's harder to control. Not, not the temperature of the soda ash as you add it to the parchment machine, but the vat in there at will. Uh, all the books on chemistry say that any reaction it generally is speeded up by a factor of two or doubled every time you raise the temperature about 18 degrees Fahrenheit or 10 degrees centigrade. So that any time you increase the temperature, you increase the speed of the reaction and make it more efficient. So it would be the temperature in the vat that's important. What I wanted to do is to cover in the next few minutes some of the properties of some of the tub sizes. We've gotten the sheet through the acid, through the sour water, through the washer section, and over part of the dryers up to the tub size. We want to talk about some about tub sizes that we put on in parchment, what properties they give to the sheet, what is important in the way they're added on the parchment machine, and we would start first with plasticizers. Now, plasticizers are not a big item with the parchment division at this time. When I started working here, it was very big because we made a lot of parchment for wrapping lard or shortening or butter. And it, when they wrapped the parchment around the product, they wanted it to be soft and pliable so that it wouldn't break and allow the, parch the shortening or lard to leak out and stain the carton. We don't sell hard any parchment for that purpose anymore, and so it's not that critical. We do use some sorbitol and glycerin for plasticizing and it's mainly 
some sheets they want to make it softer and pliable, some they want to get just a little bit of the harsh feel out of the sheet. The thing that's important in, in adding a plasticizer is that you've got to get some of it down into the sheet and that you've got to get it applied uniformly across the sheet. If you apply it non-uniformly, you're going to have a streaky looking sheet. Uh, ahead of the size press, it's very difficult to get the sheet completely dry. If you get it completely dry, you can apply a uniform looking uh, plasticizer treatment to the sheet. But you don't really want it dry because if you get it real dry, then the plasticizer can burn off on the after dryers more readily. And actually, to perform its function, you want it to penetrate into the sheet. For it to be able to penetrate into the sheet and get a good looking appearance, you have to have the sheet uniformly wet. It cannot be streaky dry. It has to go into the size press looking uniformly wet so that the plasticizer will wet the sheet uniformly and penetrate into the sheet uniformly and you'll get a, a good uniform treatment. Now, this is critical in order to get a good treatment. Uh, one problem you have when you do this is that you run into the size press wet, you carry a lot of water in with it, and when you carry the water in, it dilutes the tub size and changes the concentration, so you have to make allowances for this. Uh, years ago, if we wanted to run with a 25% solution of plasticizer, we always made up essentially 40%, and just the dilution by water being carried into the sheet would lower the concentration that much. We applied some treatments to improve the grease proofness of the sheet. And by doing that, we have two areas where we measure grease, or three areas where we measure grease proofness. Uh, one is, will a grease or shortening penetrate through the sheet? If you've got a well parchmentized surface, it will not penetrate through the sheet or soak into the sheet. It, however, there can be pinholes that could allow it to go through, and some treatments tend to close up pinholes, although it's very difficult, and it's, if there are pinholes in the sheet of parchment, it's hard to find any starch or film former that'll cover them. We've made some treatments that did help. And the other third type of measure of grease resistance is the wicking along the surface. If you wrap, say, shortening with a sheet of parchment, you don't want it to, uh, there, there's folds, and you don't want it to wick down between the folds and out around and onto the carton. And to get this type of protection, we used to use starch. And when the other chemicals became available, why CMC or PVA were more efficient. And then Quillon is perhaps the most efficient material that we have for stopping the wicking and in grease resistance. In water repellency, we some grades we wanted to get that. Originally we started with uh, wax and then treatments and then we got Quillon and we have also used some Aquapel for this. But the next property we want is Quillon or release. We have release from Quillon and silicone. And I would like to talk first about Quillon. And a lot of the things I say about Quillon will apply also to silicone. So I have some drawings here to help give you an idea of what Quillon treatment is like and how it performs. And what I have done is to depict a cross-section of a sheet of paper with Quillon molecules sticking up on it. Now this is I idealized theory, but basically Quillon is a stratochromic chloride. It has a long molecule of stearate, say something like this pointer. Now on the bottom, there's a chromium at atom and also a chloride atom on there. The chloride's function is to make it so it's soluble so we can get it into the solution and apply it onto the sheet of paper. 
the chromium, they tell us, tends to bond to the sheet of paper. So that theoretically what you have is a sheet of paper with chromium molecule from the uh, stearatochromic chloride bonding to the, to the parchment and the stearate sticking up. And the stearate is, tends to be a waxy-like material and it will repel a lot of materials. And this includes water and turpentine and a lot of the adhesive matters, materials that we use. And that's why uh, the quillon is used as this treatment. Uh, you have to have quillon in solution in order to apply it. The solution is the stearatochromic chloride. As the quillon cures, it, the chloride atom, atom is released and goes off as hydrochloric acid. If you add alkali to it, it'll take the chloride ion off before you want it to come off in a solution. If you, and if you're, in other words, when you carry sodash into your quillon solution, what you're doing is you're knocking a chloride atom off. It becomes then non-soluble. You get a sludge and a gunky looking quillon. It doesn't work on the parchment because you have to get it onto the parchment in the small molecule so it can uh, line up and orient and cure on the parchment. If it cures in the, sh in the solution, it is no good to you. You've ruined the material. So that when you carry sodash on the sheet of parchment over the dryers and into the tub size solution, you ruin the tub size solution. It's very critical that that washing that we were talking about a few minutes ago is done properly and you get this off. Now, what we end up then with is the stearate molecule sticking up and the chrome bonded to the sheet of parchment. Now, I, I say this is kind of idealized, but what happens is it, if you get a water drop on this, the water doesn't wet the little stearate molecules. So you have a water staying up there as a drop on top of, of the stearate molecules. And you put oil on there, it'll stay up there. You put your turpentine test on there and it doesn't wick out on the sheet. It stays there in a little line or a ball. That's because the stearate molecules are repelling the water or the turpentine. And that's how the thing works. So the th critical thing for you to remember is you've got to keep the salts out of it. You've got to get it well washed. Also, this quillon is affected by this principle of temperature. As the temperature goes up uh, 18 degrees, you double the rate of reaction. And if this material, always, there's always something in there that's causing it to polymerize in the bath and ruin your bath. Therefore, on the sheet, I have... Uh, I've got the temperature as a critical item, and it should be less than 70 degrees Fahrenheit in order to run a good quillon solution. If you get up as high as 80 while your reaction is, is going to, your rate of reaction in the bath is going to double, your bath life is cut in half. If you get up over 90, why, then it's not cut in half, it's cut to one fourth, and you lose your efficiency of your quillon treatment. The item of concentration in regard to quillon is an item where that theoretically all you need in, is enough quillon to give a single layer across the sheet. If you put on extra, it doesn't do much good. In fact, they sometimes say it does harm because it allows the molecules to lay crosswise and get all, can't get them on there and oriented properly. Uh, another problem when concentration, if you increase the concentration, you're increasing the chloride concentration. You're increasing, when it reacts, you have hydrochloric acid as your product. You're lowering the pH of your tub size and your finished parchment. So then another thing you try to do to improve that is you carry more 
try to more neutralizing of the parchment. You carry more soda ash into your bath. That ruins your bath. So you need more concentration and you build that up and you just start chasing your tail. So it's critical to run with the desired or minimum concentration and at a low temperature in order to get a good bath life. Uh, I think you're all familiar with these end uses of parchment, of the quillon parchment. The, what I had down for contamination and usually is, relates to what's being carried over from the washers. Are there any questions in, in the use of quillon? Yes. 